I think I'm just gonna stop there or I'll just blab on forever because the real reason you guys are here is to learn about Brian Haynes and his amazing artwork. And I suspect, I mean, who here knows Brian Haynes' artwork here? Yeah, right. To know him is to love him and to be blown away and to, as soon as you can possibly save up the cash, hang one of those pieces on your wall. Um, I wanna let you know that um, Petra is, is in the back there. She's, she's got an original Brian painting of, um, of their beautiful dog um, in memory of, of Willie. Um, but she's also got a stack of the coolest coffee table book that you could possibly own, which is chock full of Brian Haynes paintings. Um, and a bunch of them are places you know. Um, and a lot of them, a lot of those have sort of a fanciful twist to it. Um, if you know Brian's work, you know. Um, so those are for sale back there and you know somebody who wants one. So like just get those. Two other things I wanna say is we've got this QR code in the back, which is basically a survey about the Big Muddy Speaker Series. A few quick questions. If at the end, you could just shoot that QR code do our little survey, it would help us get your feelings and your feedback. You don't have to do that either. You can email through our website, your thoughts about the speaker series, preferably the riverleaf.org website, honestly. I don't even know where the other website emails go to, but um, they, get, they get lost in spam world. It, it's a nightmare, but, um, um, but we'd love your ideas on pre presenters. We'd love like your tips, like what's it like to be here? What do you wish we would do um, differently or better? For example, I'm just gonna shout it out. Um, one of the people in the crowd here, Rob has been coming to these and occasionally presenting for as long as we've been doing it. And he's like, you guys need a better screen. So he brought his from work to sort of show like, okay, it could, life could be better. Um, and so he's offered to help uh, actually purchase a better screen. So um, we'll be doing that, you know? So I'm not saying that you have to pay for anything you suggest for, but it's pretty cool when people do, but, um, but ideas are how we get better. So that's all. Okay, then yeah, starting with your olives. Okay. Who else is in potluck snacks? All right. Let it be done. Brian, thank you so much. Thank you. Let's talk loud. Hey, here we go. Ah, well. What a great int introduction. Thank you, Steve. Um, and now I know why it's called the Big Money Series. <laughs> um, thanks for having me here and a lot of familiar faces. I think I saw you a couple of weeks ago, actually, most of you. So thanks for all that you guys do and uh, get out in the river and do the hard work. Some of us just sit in a nice, cool place and just paint pictures. <laughs> so my story tonight is basically, how did I get here? I'm from Kirkwood, Missouri, but I roundabout way went to art school via New Mexico, Pasadena, California, met my lovely wife and then returned to Missouri and then ended up painting the scenes that we, uh, I love and that I hope you love too. Um, so Art Center College of Design, Pasadena, California, it's the top design school in the world and my parents, I credit my success to them because they said, you can be an artist, you can make a living at it. You don't have to be an electrician first. Nothing against electricians, I wish I was one actually. But um, you know, they said you could do it. So they supported me all along, it was, it was great. So yeah. So I need to do that. Okay, I'm gonna reach forward and press the button. Um, so three years of art school, we're talking graduating 1983. Ah. Nice, okay. Um, you just kind of are shoved out into the world. This is pre-internet. This is how things used to be done. So this was a sketch 
um, that I did sitting in the back row of a board meeting between the bank people, the movie producers, and the design studios and artists were paid by the hour to sit in the back and just draw ideas that you were hearing. And so at the end of the thing, they'd turn to you and say, what do you got? Because it needed to be something visual. The ideas had to be visualized to bring to a bank to get capitalized their films. So this is Christopher Reeves, um, Superman three. Got representation in New York, that was key. So I'm freelancing, walking around the streets of Los Angeles with my little portfolio, sweating on days like today, <laughs> um, but getting a rep, an artist agent in New York was key. So I started to have a style that was kind of art deco. And so I'd get phone calls for this kind of look. This was a shopping bag in 1987 for Estee Lauder, oops. Um, Publishing is in New York, so things like Agatha Christie's mystery book covers with that retro Art Deco look <clears throat> started to come my way and it was so fun. So <clears throat> I'm painting now on illustration board. It's a, a, a board with paper um, surface with acrylic because it had to dry fast, had to ship like the next day. FedEx was new, Woo! you could ship, ship things overnight, you know. I couldn't afford a fax machine yet, but that's coming. Um, Boulder, Colorado, Celestial Seasonings. Um, uh, just illustration that was done back in the day. Let me take you through <clears throat> a typical illustration assignment. So I'm in Los Angeles, but I have representation now in St. Louis, which actually a lot of corporate heads were in St. Louis. It was actually a great place to get freelance assignments. So the St. Louis Symphony calls and says, could you do a series of retro posters for various countries we're going to do, Germany, Austria, uh, France? Um, of course, they want them like travel posters, like 1930s travel posters. So the art director had no sketch. She said, could you just, you know, uh, fax me? I could afford a fax machine. It was like $1,200 then. Could you fax me a sketch overnight? Yes, I can do that. So... <laughs> So this is about this big, this little sketch in a sketchbook um, about um, French style. She said, great, I like that. Oh, I get, I get this call on Thursday. So I did that sketch on Friday. This is over the weekend, further refining that sketch. On Monday, she says, great, we're good to go. So this is the final painting. It's about this big, just on illustration board, and it had to be shipped and arrived by Friday. So it's, it's one week turnaround. It was very typical of illustration assignments at the time. Do you guys remember Southwestern Bell? My gosh, this is like 1989, still living in Los Angeles, got my rep in St. Louis calls and said, Post-Dispatch wants to do a whole series of double page spreads of this black and white artwork, woohoo! So um, that was a great assignment. So these paintings are really big. Um, they had kind of a headache um, uh, reproducing those because I was, as I was mentioning to someone earlier, at the time you take that illustration board, you peel off the paper and the painting, and then they put it on a drum scan and it whirls around and then the scanner goes slowly down to that rotating drum to get every line of image. That's how it was done at the time. We started to get, I married my lovely wife. We thought of getting that nest building kind of feel, you know, and the, boy, the housing prices in California were huge. So we decided it'd be best to move back to Missouri. A lot of my clients were here. We could raise our kids with cousins, grandparents. And so we did that. One of the first person I met was Susan Block, an interior designer in St. Louis. And she commissioned this piece. This is a portrait of her to uh, show off her smoking paraphernalia collection she has. So this is like a, this is big. This is like four feet tall. It's now above her mantle at the Chase Park Plaza. Um, illustration assignments continue to come my way. Now this was an interesting one. Um, if you've driven on Highway 7, 70 past the Legends, on the other side, it's actually in Kansas, Kansas City, Kansas. Yeah, so they called and said, we need 
a series of illustrations done that'll turn into sculptures. This was through a designer. And so I started to, she said, just conceive uh, anything you want about notable people who are from Kansas. Amelia Earhart came to mind. So it's just started drawing her, forgot about it. I would just send off these concept sketches, completely forgot about it until she sent this. Now we have email. Woo! And she sent this to me and said, well, the sculptor created this uh, 3D sculpture of your drawing. Hey, what about Chrysler? I thought, wouldn't it be cool if Chrysler himself was a hood ornament? <laughs> and so I just forgot about it, you know, sent it off to her. And then uh, a couple months later, whoa, the, the sculptor in Florida, and you'll see these, they're still there in the, the legends. There's murals, there's all kinds of things there that we worked together. It was very collaborative, it was really fun. Um, but meanwhile, I'm back in Missouri. I had forgotten the beauty of the Missouri landscape. California is great. California is grand and huge and, and awesome, but Missouri is beautiful and it's undulating curves and the color, especially in fall. So I just did this. It, it's difficult to see, but uh, for myself, this is about five feet wide. And if you could get close, you could see the shapes of the trees still have that Art Deco circles, spheres, diagonals, um, sculptural shapes that I still wanted to keep in the paintings um, completely for myself. But what happened was people saw them. I had a gallery in Ledoux, started to represent them, and they started to sell to my surprise. We all know Dan Burkhart. Yeah, wonderful guy, very philanthropic. This is his winery, um, Bethlehem Valley Vineyards where they grow the grapes for Mount Pleasant, or they used to until recently, um, the Norton and this uh, uh, Chardonnay grapes. Um, this is outside Marthasville. So commissioned to do their uh, Missouri landscape. But I thought more than landscape, I'm an illustrator by training. Why don't I try to tell stories? Why don't I try to put figures within that landscape to make a story start to develop because we had moved from Soulard, downtown St. Louis with our little girl. We moved her out to Labadee, Missouri where there's a little school, elementary school has one class per grade it was perfect. Both our girls went through there and it was just a great place to live because there were still farmers there farming. There's engineers and doctors and lawyers but there's people who have been there for five generations. So th through listening to them, um, we knew a gentleman who doctored horses with mason jars of concoctions, you know, and he was still doing it. He passed away. Um, Petra, you'll probably remember, his, Petra is my Google, so she'll remember his name. But um, Elmer Sontag, isn't that a great name? That's a Labity old guy name, right? Well, he moved to Labity in the 40s and with his wife cleared the land with mules to farm it. So to me, Having come from California, you know, come back, that was like touching back to the 19th century. And so there was these rich stories to tell. Uh, Jim and Mary Deerberg uh, came to me and commissioned this piece of Herman um, that's now in the First Bank uh, building in Herman. They kind of wanted a 1920 view just before they built the bridge. Again, of a romantic 19th century, that's what I was going after. And as an illustrator, it was fun to flex that romantic muscle. <laughs> this is the second one for the Deerbergs. This was about Drei Eisheiligen, um, which is the three ice men. That's the days in May when you can, it's safe now to uh, plant the vine cuttings and they won't get nipped by the frost. and my friend Franz Mayer, wonderful canoeist. Um, he loves to stand up in the canoe. As a matter of fact, he always stands up in the canoe with a pole, not even a paddle. He pulls down old school. And he, he likes it because he can see the ripples ahead. He can see the depth of the water, what fish are down there. You know what I'm saying. And I just love that image of him. Um, Dan Burkhardt came back to me and asked if I would do a mural for a niche restaurant in Forsyth Boulevard in Clayton, remember? Very fancy restaurant, but what they were doing was indigenous Missouri uh, things to eat that were seasonal. 
we ate there in November and there was a lot of stuff with acorns. So that wasn't the best. I suggest going there in like, you know, August would be better. But this, hopefully it's kind of dark, it's hard to see, but it expresses that undulating landscape that, that we love about this place and the verdant, the abundance of things that can grow here, right? Um, this painting is actually 80 inches tall and 60 inches wide because I wanted to express that, that hugeness of a sycamore tree, right? Uh, my wife and I took a trip to um, Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, where my hero, N.C. Wyeth, had his studio and, and Howard Pyle, these you know, uh, early 20th century illustrators. And there was a huge sycamore tree that was on the Brandywine battlefield. And it was there during the Revolutionary War. It was right next to Lafayette's headquarters. I mean, so I don't know, it's, that's not expressed in this piece, but the grandeur of that beautiful type of tree, I hope is. Another gentleman came to me, Timothy Drone of Kirkwood, Missouri. He collects, he's the foremost collector of Osage artifacts. As a matter of fact, the St. Louis Art Museum borrows a lot of his artifacts for shows. They had a show in 2006 of the art of the Osage. So he brought me this Osage orange gunstock club. I got to hold it and see the little carvings on it of men in canoes. You can see if you look really close. Now they could age, they could date this uh, gunstock club because of the metal French trade item, the blade, to 1750. Um, it has a serrated edge that was a lightning design that meant that it could strike swiftly. It's not big, but it's heavy and it is well balanced and it was just amazing to hold. Now the reason they call it a gunstock club is because in the 1750s, you know, powder weapons were new to Native Americans. And so if they couldn't have one, they wanted the power of that weapon symbolized in the shape of the gun stock. So he said, please build a painting around that object. What a delight for an illustrator to get. So furiously, I go in my sketchbook, a little sketch about this big, just trying to show natives moving through a forest and repeating that gun stock shape, if I could, throughout the forest. But you got to research, right? So there were uh, 19th century photographs of um, Sac and Fox warriors. Now this guy went into, walked, rode a horse, or uh, rode a trolley into the 1840 Broadway downtown St. Louis studio of Thomas Easterly and had his photograph taken. But think about that. Uh, that's pretty incredible. And then I have my friend Josh, who uh, reenacts at Fort Deschard and other places, uh, Osage Warriors. So I photographed him and then take those photographs and on my easel, start to sketch from that, move, you know, uh, still photographs of a moving figure. Um, behind our house in Labity was this little creek and I went back there to sketch a little spring painting because I'm thinking the menace of those warriors uh, against the springtime scene, the beauty and abundance of that springtime and the menace of the warriors might be a grand thing to put together. Um, this is the final piece. Um, it's 64 inches wide and um, now is in um, St. Louis University. He uh, donated to the university. But out of that came a whole series of research I did about the Osage Indians, which fascinated me. A typical brave, as some of you may know, 6'5". Um, really large people. The diet was wonderful. You know, they had the three sisters, the corn, the beans, the squash, but also, of course, hunted uh, even bison before they were um, hunted out of the Missouri area. So this expresses their um, bifurcated philosophy of everything, dark and light, um, you know, uh, water, air, male, female, everything was built in opposites. Kingfisher bird, though, could go between worlds. He could go from air to water and, and fish. So he was held in high esteem and would often dictate the success of the annual elk hunt on the bluffs along the Missouri River. Um, um, Robert Trulask, who passed away, but he donated the law school, I believe, or the business school here. He commissioned this 
for his hunt lodge in New Melly. This is nine feet wide. And he found when we had a drought at the bottom of a precipice, he thinks he found fossilized bison bones. He thinks that they drove bison off that precipice on his property in New Melly. So he wanted to have that shown um, pre-European contact. Another place we just like to camp on the Merrimack River. I call this Osage River just to tie in with the natives, but it's one of our favorite camping places. Um, you guys know Ru Yavitz. Um, he commissioned this piece for his place, um, uh, the mansion uh, um, they have on Florissant. It's uh, the Deloge Mansion. He would like to have seen Osage on horseback. So, um, a professor at uh, Mizzou commissioned this about uh, Boone's Lick because the Boones, as you know, Nathan Boone went, made a lot of money at Boone's Lick in 1805, um, boiling down salt. Boy, they had a production going. Um, the whole family was involved and they were making a lot of money, but the natives kept coming and harvesting their oxen. <laughs> so they actually had to shut down the works. We have a remote cabin in Madison County, right on the junction of Marble Creek and uh, the St. Francis. And this guy, he's passed away now, but this is Clifford Jones. And he dresses like this and he'll arrive at the door once in a while. He's got a crush on my 85 year old mom. He says, is Diane there? Um, and he'll show up with either some squirrels he just shot. I'm not kidding you. He'll have a gun, some squirrels and a beer, always doesn't matter what time of day. Um, or fish or some offering for Diane. He's a gentleman though, he'll sit outside, didn't come inside and just wanna chat, you know. Uh, he's passed away, but it's, it's just a wonderful thing when he would come by. Now also, I was commissioned to do something about Mark Twain. Every artist in Missouri has to do Mark Twain, right? And the stories are so rich. How do you even decide what to in, you know, include? Um, so I couldn't, I just had to edit. Um, and the text that you see there is the preface to Tom Sawyer, um, his masterpiece. And it's just a wonderful way he worded it, like we're really still all kids. I mean, that's kind of the essence of boil down. Um, um, this is um, St. Albans, Missouri, when the river was up against the banks of St. Albans. In 1911, there was a flood and forevermore, it has been over in Defiance, Missouri. This is about 1850. It's hard to see, but it's the Becker family harvesting. Um, I was commissioned to do a piece and I started to read Schoolcraft's journals. Everybody knows about school. He described um, Carolina parakeets. I had no idea. The Carolina parakeet was a ubiquitous bird here. Excuse me, if you don't know, it's this parakeet and it's loud and it's green and it's yellow and they, come in flocks in the springs of hundreds of them. They would decimate a settler's corn crop. So they were harvested, they were killed. And the, the socialization, the strange phenomenon of a uh, Carolina parakeet is when one is injured, it falls to the ground and all the rest of them say, what's the matter? And they all come and descend upon it and see what's happening. And of course they're just sitting ducks then. So they were exterminated by 1900 because about that time, uh, women had those beautiful hats and they sported wonderful tail feathers from birds like, as a matter of fact, um, there was a Degas show at the St. Louis Art Museum and together with that was a millinery show showing the production of hats and there were three carcasses, not even just the tail feathers, the whole bird sitting on this beautiful hat. <laughs> um, St. Albans, if you haven't been there, is an interesting place because the wealthy people discovered it and uh, started to build uh, exclusive homes there back all the way to 1909 when Theodore Link, who was the architect who built Union Station in St. Louis, was commissioned to build some of these mansions out there. The Johnson family who had brown shoe, their mansion is still there. It's called the studio. It now looks diminutive compared to the Mick mansions, but it really is beautiful. It's to scale. And it sits up on a hill and it's lovely. So this is um, Theodore Link painting with the St. Louis Artist Guild, which is 150 years old. And they drove their motor cars out there and uh, would 
uh, picnic. And so in order to do this, I had my older daughter, older daughter um, model for the beautiful um, feminine angels there. And my younger daughter were the German farmer boys who came to spy on them. <laughs> Um, but I started to think, I want to tell more stories. How about men working on various things? This is New Haven, Missouri, right along Highway 100. You'll see this farm still down there. And I was starting to think about climate change. So some of those feelings are in this painting as well. Or pick up a journal and you hear about um, mm -hmm. shingle makers who you could hire a team of shingle makers who would harvest a green white oak, believe it or not, and with the wafers, cut it geometrically up into shingles and um, use a draw knife and then put it still green on the roof. Wow. <laughs> uh, men working, how about sledge crew at a circus? Um, another project through Dan Burkhart was the Growing Up with the River children's book. It's wonderful if you haven't seen it. it we call it a stealth adult book because we learn so much about it, but it's like for kids about 12 and it goes along from Herman to the confluence, each little town. So this is New Haven, 1880. We had kind of a cold decade when the river froze over and entrepreneurial New Havens thought, let's harvest the ice. So this is a romanticized view of how they would, they would do it. That um, business morphed into the Pepsi bottling business. The Zobris family still, she has, have the, they have the Bep, uh, Pepsi bottling business. She has her grandfather's I saw still, which is kind of cool. Um, this is the chapter about Washington, Missouri, 1930s. A lot of men working, looking for work. What did they do? They um, harvested willows from upstream and put them on barges, thousands of them, and brought them down and wove mats to prevent erosion along the river. And sometimes, when we have a drought, you can still see the remnants of those uh, woven giant mats. <laughs> uh, music's always involved in storytelling. Um, there was a wonderful book written about the Labadee St. Albans area, and there's a road called Fiddle Creek Road. The reason it got its name was there's little shacks that were built for the railroad workers as they came through. And some of them just happened to be fiddlers along this road. And on a Saturday night, one would do a riff from his porch and he'd listen and it would be a call and response from the guys from across the, uh, the valley. Um, but I always wondered what maybe Sunday morning might look like. Yeah. <laughs> I think she wants to go to church. Um, this is a piece just called Notes on a Staff. or St. Genevieve, what a rich history to talk about there. This is commissioned by Hank Johnson of um, Chaumette Vineyards in St. Genevieve. Um, what about Indian slavery? My gosh, um, that's a big story to tell about that. It's kind of hard to see the um, slaves in the corner. <clears throat> then my little town of Labadee had the Hawthorne Inn and it burnt down. So they had this new space and they contacted me and said, well, would you do a mural? And so I'd never done a big giant piece of art like that. So of course I leapt at the chance to tell the story of Sylvester Labadee. Now, if you don't know, he was a very successful fur trader. He was partners with Manuel Lisa in St. Louis and he owned the Spanish land grant that became the Labadee Township. He probably never came out there, but in um, 1880, there was discovered in Labadee's cave, the skeleton of a man entwined with the skeleton of a bear right at the entrance of the cave. That's cool. And out of this legend came, well, Sylvester Labity was out there with his son, his son, and they got fighting a bear and uh, wrestled. And uh, uh, it's not true. He's buried, <laughs> he's buried at Bellefontaine Cemetery, but it, it makes a great legend. It's a great story, doesn't it? So this is pre-European contact all the way over to the electrification of Labity in 1933. Um, Novus International and St. Charles Research Park uh, 
this is a large piece for their lobby. Um, they do very sustainable um, animal feed. Doesn't sound very exciting, but uh, then the Missouri Botanical Garden called and said, could you do a mural in honor of Peter Raven's 40 years of being at the garden? Well, what an honor and what a rich history to tell there. He uh, refurbished the Climatron. He instituted the Japanese garden. He spent 25 years in China. So there's so much to say, but his main research was the, and he developed it along with another botanist, um, the uh, co-evolution of pollinators and evening primrose. Doesn't sound exciting, but it is because they were the start of the co-evolving of species, that whole concept. And so I wanted in the center axis of this to have an evening primrose and pollinators dividing the space. Now I worked in secret with his wife, Pat, and she said, well, you gotta have ravens in there. And I, okay, it doesn't make any sense, but yes. The, the, sure, okay, whatever you want. So this is now in the permanent collection of the garden, but I also did a smaller one for the ravens for their home. And then the arch called, they were doing a big renovation. So um, they needed people when they're down under the, you know, you're kind of disoriented when you go down under there, you don't know which way, what, what. So they wanted to have something about the 1965 building of the arch and then an 1850 levee scene and make it happen with both. Okay, could you please, with a map in the center. <laughs> um, so as you can see, I'm using, I'm trying to repeat the arch shape in this composition. That actually didn't survive. This is the final 23 foot wide, 15 foot tall piece. Um, so you've got your 1965 and your 1850. But of course, uh, research is the fun of a lot of this. And I researched, nobody died, you know? No, there was no OSHA. You didn't have to wear a helmet. I mean, you weren't strapped up. It was just incredible what these guys did. And then one guy told me a story. He said, well, it was Sunday and the foreman wasn't there. And we were pretty high up. And remember they had that net between the two legs and they thought that doesn't look like it's gonna do much. And so they said, let's get a canvas bag. We'll put some tools in it. We're not using about the weight of a man. And we'll just push it off our little tiny deck we're standing on. And the slight breeze blew it on an angle where it missed the net entirely and almost went in the river. <laughs> yeah. So I, it's amazing what those guys achieved. Um, this is really hard to see, but it's actually the largest, it looks really small. It's the largest painting I've ever done. It's 80 feet by five feet tall. And it's over at the uh, Kaufman Foundation in uh, Brush Creek in Kansas City. So uh, it's, they said, Brian, could you just express on the entrepreneurial spirit yeah. in 80 feet? I think that's enough space to do. <laughs> so this is the center panel um, with Ewan Kaufman, of course, thinking about it all over there. Um, it's the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, Sharon Hunt called, who owns the Kansas City Chiefs, and said, could you do a painting about Missouri for Arrowhead Stadium? So this is, this is about 12 feet wide. And... It expresses, you know, the stout. We're stout, we're honest, we're hardworking, right? That's what we are with our famous folks, but we're also the center of plant research, right? With the Danforth Plant Science Center um, and Wash U and SLU. So we've got the DNA double helix. And within that, um, it's easier to see at my studio are all the fish, the invertebrates, the mammals, the insects of Missouri, plants all wound into that. Uh, design. <clears throat> Edward Jones came to me, my studio, and said, could you do something to express Ted and Pat Jones? They have been so generous to us, right? They said, we don't have kids, so we're just going to give to the state. And they did, didn't they? My gosh, the confluence, what else? Um, their little place between here, Washington, and uh, I forgot what it's called. Um, uh, yes, thank you, Steve. Um, so visiting their place, we got to spend some time with Pat before she passed. It was great. It was kind of a rainy day and my 
85 year old mom was with me and they could talk is great. I could photograph and, and listen to the conversation. So we went in the little Rover. He's driving around with the little dog and he just jumps out and starts ripping around wherever he feels like it. Well, this school bus came and uh, these kids probably from Columbia, some elementary school, and they disembark and they go running with their fish nets and their butterfly nets right over to the pond and just start playing in the mud. And Pat's face just started to glow because that's what she was about, getting kids involved, getting the richness. Um, she was a botanist too, right? Um, soil, soil. soil sun, yes, thank you. Um, and she, and she was just thrilled. I loved the look on her face. So I'm driving home with my mom after that thinking, this is a financial institution. How am I gonna express both numbers and what she's excited about, nature, nature and numbers. Na oh my God, what about the Fibonacci series, the um, Renaissance discovery by Fibonacci of the sequence of numbers that we see in everything, uh, we call them fractals now. If you add zero to one, you get one. If you one and one is two, two and one is three, two and three is five, and you just keep going adding the pairs of numbers, you start to get a progression of numbers. He discovered if you put them in squares and you do a circle that describes that and you put them, align them, you get a spiral. And from that comes cloud shapes, the way water flows, leaves are made, insect legs, everything. So this sketch describes that over and over with um, Ted and Pat in the center. This is about 20 feet wide and it's at the headquarters of uh, Edward Jones. And I, I don't know if those numbers come through, but I think there's something stable, there's something repetitive, there's something building within this armature that's underneath the painting that I hope expresses that um, numbers and nature combination. Um, the History Museum called. And they said, could you do something called Trails West? From here, St. Louis was the start of all the trails, right? I mean, Santa Fe Trail, Oregon Trail, and more that I didn't even know about. And they all start on the rivers heading west. Well, what if we were to show the confluence of the Missouri and the Mississippi, and then the Great Plains, the Rocky Mountains, and the Pacific Ocean in one view? <laughs> they said, can't be done. Well, I, well why don't I just try? <laughs> But I thought, what if you lay the whole nation on its side and you just start looking west? You got the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> uh, so it's fanciful, but it, my house. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, wonderful couple, Art and Amelia Bond. They do a lot of charity work. She looked, works at St. Louis Community, St. Louis Community Foundation, a philanthropic. Um, organization and they came to me and he's an architect and they said we love your work could you do something for us that expresses our 30th wedding anniversary um, of course they 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 love he loves hunting he collects duck decoys which is a whole art in itself that I discovered beautiful sculptures really is what they are they had a place up a very romantic cabin up on a knob in around Lafayette Missouri up along the Mississippi and so kind of putting that all together, again, driving home from their house, how can I get some Greek mythology in there too? I don't know why. Um, so Icarus, that's art himself and he's carving, but he's dreaming about Persephone because he's romantic, right? And his, his muse, his, his dreams as he's creating is Persephone. And if you were to see this closer, it's the nude uh, torso of a woman. And so this thing is six feet tall and five feet wide. It's an enormous painting. Um, that uh, Art's a pretty tall guy, so that's the painting at his house. Um, I brought it to him. They said, we love it, but we're uncomfortable with the female nude form in there. So I said, well, okay, it's your painting. So I come back, stood about two weeks, painted her out. Now she's just a tree. Bring it back in. They said, we're really embarrassed, but we want you to put it back in. Because <laughs> I... I wanted my Persephone in there, so <laughs> you guys know where this is. Jam up cave, romanticized. Okay, it's very romanticized. Um, 
my friend Mike Smith, who some of you may know, told me about, oh gosh, I've forgotten the name, but there's remnants of plants from the last ice age 10,000 years ago that find little niches where they still live, north facing little, little places. Well, apparently on the top of this, there's a bunch. Um, Steve, help me out. Uh, there's some. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one of our friends like studied like oh, oh, on yeah. the ropes on like, jamble like, yeah you know yeah studying those plants cool okay so it, it's real thank you thank you brett perfect well what i liked is much more elemental much simpler i was looking for my campsite up here and i turned around and i saw oh my god you can almost see the chunks the water is so clear because it's a rock bottom stream it's so clear. You can almost see the chunks down here and where they came. You can almost piece the puzzle back together in a way because the rock, that's what I was trying to express with this. Um, um, a couple came to me, their, their kids are kind of leaving the home and they, they wanted to remember the winter floats they had on the current river. Um, so that's just a, a scene of some of their camps. Keith Holler came to me. He owns the property where that amazing Rock Island trellis goes over the Gasconade. You know what I'm talking about? It actually caught on fire a couple of years ago because it's abandoned. It's now going to be a trail, a bike trail, right? The Rock Island. So he remembers going as a kid. It's kind of hard to see, but there's, I, I put the train back up there and there's a tunnel right here and it would come out the tunnel he and his brother, twin brother, would be, you know, hiking around. Their parents told him not to go up there, but of course, that's where you go to see the train emerge from the tunnel up there. Pretty cool. Um, I did go to University of New Mexico um, in the late 70s and always had romance about that place. It just gets into an artist's blood. And so I was so thrilled that a gallery in Santa Fe, Manitou Gallery, ask if I could contribute work there. So this is, if you've been to the high road between um, Santa Fe and Taos, this is Chimayo and the Santuario. <clears throat> but going to Jemez for the annual corn dance was unbelievable. <clears throat> You're one of the few white people because I actually knew that it was in late August. I, I was in Santa Fe for several weeks. I called the tourism bureau and they said, there's no schedule. It just happens when it happens. So I thought, well, I'm going, I'm, and fortunately I did. They will, although I understand this, they will not allow any phones, photographs. You can't even sketch. So I had to remember this scene when I got back to my uh, apartment and sketched. Uh, it's just, um, it's kind of dark. It's hard to see, but it's quiet, except for the, the bells on their ankles and the drumming, just incredible. I'm so envious of them because they've been in one place for thousands of years. I don't know. It just, uh... oh, and then a local Lavity gentleman loves his white oak tree. And he said, could you do a portrait of my tree in Lavity? And so this hangs above his, and then other people started coming. This is in Troy, Missouri, a giant white oak. It's enormous. Um, my friend, Franz Mayer, again, this is his place. In, um, on the bluffs above Augusta. Um, he thinks this is 450 years old and he's an arborist. So I think he's probably right. COVID was coming. This is March, 2020. And I just uh, wanted to do a painting for the gallery in Santa Fe about something about loss and going off into the unknown. So this is called Farewell. Um, just a commission of a place in um, Matson, Missouri, high above the Missouri River. This, I thank Steve because he corrected me on this. I was, <laughs> I did this for a couple who live in Connecticut, but they spent two of the wonderful years. They love Missouri. So this is the center panel. It's a, actually a triptych. They have a, a piece about Kansas City and a piece about St. Louis. And this is the center section because they got to paddle on some of our wonderful streams. They said, do the Missouri because there's the Katy Trail on one side, right? So I did, and, and then Steve pointed out, yeah, but the kayakers are going the wrong way. <laughs> and Steve was right. 
<laughs> so I think I'm just going to flip the image around. And... <laughs> but then the, the Katie would be on the south side. Oh. <laughs> Then the, sun. <laughs> the sun would be wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, what the heck? <laughs> um, Allenton, uh, Missouri, it's this great little isthmus of land between where this horseshoe shape of the Merrimack River just carves this wonderful place where people can live in, with a very quiet surrounding. This gentleman collects all kinds of things with patterns on it, arrowheads, uh, snake skins, um, turtle shells, um, armadillo shells, uh, fossils. And I saw his collection and was marveled over it. And I thought, again, how do I get those patterns to relate to the larger pattern that I see in the landscape? And again, it's that uh, Fibonacci series. It's actually called the golden section for architects and artists called the golden section when um, uh, those swirls are put into a, a rectangle. So. If you could see that closer, you'd see those uh, patterns are related to the larger landscape. Uh, and this is a piece just finished a few days ago. And so thank you for your patience, everyone, and for listening to it. Please, if there are any questions you have about anything, um, I'd be happy to. <laughs> I was always curious about the birds you put in your picture yeah. start and why. Great question, thanks. I don't know when it started, but it, to me they express movement, um, it, almost a spiritual spirituality of of um, of nature in that they can go in a realm we can't. I mean, I've always wanted to fly as a kid, right? And it, they can go places we can, and they can move so swiftly. It it kind of gives a, almost a time lapse in a scene to me, and expresses something that's very momentary and fleeting. Let's see if I can figure out what my question is. Um, what when you're doing your research on the um, native peoples, what? How did that affect you? Yeah, um, great question. Thank you for that question. I think it's because when we moved from the city out to the to Labadee, there was so much land. Um, and to me, it, some of the forest, Engelman Woods is right there, never been logged. I mean, you could stand in that. And my, my daughter and I were doing a lot of running or cross country team. So it just, you could move through the forest in a way that maybe they used to do before the horse, before European contact. And it just started to enter our imagination because you've just felt closer to the people who might have been there really not that long ago. 200 years is not that long ago. Abbey Road, the album was made 50 years ago. That's nothing. Two Abbey Roads was the First World War. Three Abbey Roads was the Civil War. Four Abbey Roads was Lewis and Clark. I mean. Wow. That was a weird way to answer your question. Huh? <laughs> so you mentioned in response to the question about the birds time lapse yeah. and your um, painting of the Osage Indians running through the woods. Is that one Native American or is it multiples running through there? I should just leave it up to you. Oh. No, it, I, I envision it as several moving that way. Yeah, but a lot of people have asked me that. Um, and then I do have different, they are holding different weapons as a clue to the, yeah. And I just imagine before the horse, how did people move, you know, a lot of on your feet, a lot of running, I think, you know. So I, I have a kind of a question. I mean, it's more like a lead in and I'm hoping that you'll just like go. But, um, you know, we, we've got a copy of your book and just love it. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, you told the story of how you, you know, moved back to Missouri. You didn't tell kind of the story of coming from Missouri, but 
But moving back to Missouri um, and starting to get into the landscape in a new kind of way. And, and you, you mentioned how your first paintings, you know, sort of had a very stylistic, I mean, they always are very stylistic, but almost like an art deco sort of look right. at the, at the plants and stuff. And it feels to me like when, when you go through time and your and your paintings that deal with Missouri, that it's like, we're learning about the landscape as you're learning about it. And like all of a sudden these very specific plants start to appear, you know, and very specific birds. And I'm just kind of curious, like, like, if there's a story that sort of goes along with that learning process and conveying that yeah. different depth of knowledge. Yeah, great question, Stephen. It's like meeting people like you, Mike, Mike Smith and, and Mike Bauermeister and Franz Mayer and Dan Holdinghouse and a lot of you um, that I've gotten to know. So much knowledge in this room and in people who are interested in things natural that I just want to express that. And mostly it's, I learn this thing and I think, I wanna tell people about it. I wanna show the beauty of a blood root. You know, isn't that just gorgeous? And it's almost a selfish thing, but I've learned through art, the more personal a piece gets, a piece of music, a poem, a painting, the more universal it is, right? And the stylization I have uh, is purposeful. It's stylized enough to know that you're, seeing a new world, a different world, an imagined world, but realistic enough for you to come with me into that. So we'll enter in there and experience it. So I hope it's, and sometimes it's too much this way, too much that way, but sometimes it's just right. It's always just right. <laughs> no, it's going the wrong way. <laughs> so do you have any particular uh, painting, um, or, or artists that you emulate, because uh, I see a lot of Thomas Hart Benton type style yeah. uh, in your work. And so I was wondering if that might've been one of your major influences and if there are others. Oh, great question, thank you. Yeah, and I appreciate that you see that because I think almost as an, a Missouri artist who paints representational work of the landscape and people, you almost have to, because he, he said, he used the phrase crooks and hollows. He was talking about the people and the landscape. And I know just what he's talking about, the crooks and hollows, you know, and they're there in the landscape. And if you start drawing it and you try to express the feeling of that place, you're gonna end up having some similarity to that, I think. But there's Grant Wood of Iowa. There's uh, John Stuart Curry. I mean, um, uh, yeah, of, of um, Kansas. I mean, there's regionalists during that period that. Are, are pivotal and really inspiring. Plus the illustrators I mentioned before, N.C. Wyeth and Howard Pyle of New England in like 1900, 1910. Yeah. Just amazing work. Thank you both for coming up here today. This is what a treat. So my question to you is this, I used to be an editor at the conservation department, Mark Rydell, some of the other artists there, kind of the joke was I'm never painting another snake, you know, cause all the little scales. Oh, yeah. um, as a writer, I can appreciate that sense of like during the creative process, you get us, you get, you're excited in the beginning, it's coming together, you're fleshing it out. And at least with writing, I can't speak to what you do, but there's, um, it's challenging to get to the very end. And sometimes my little motto to myself is the last 2% is 98% of the work, like to just push it to completion. Yeah. I'm curious when you're painting yet another amazing tree, for example, I can't even imagine how many branches there are there. Um, do you have a mantra for yourself or how do you, you know, how do you keep going? Because learning the facts up front, it's exciting in this and that, but I'm sure there's I mean, obviously there's um, inspiration and then there's the work to create that. I wondered if you could just speak to that for a moment. What a great question, Brett, thank you. And I know it's probably similar for you. Doing that first sketch is really exciting, right? And doing the first little color uh, rendering, that's where all the fun is. And you're always just trying to get back to that inspiration. The big piece gets complicated and the, 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 the scales on the, oh my God, yeah laboring over that and you get away from 
the, the really impactful, juicy inspiration you had in the beginning. And I talked with my brother, who's an artist as well. We both have trouble getting back to that. And the last bit is really hard to do. Um, with those tree paintings you're talking about, I simply have to set it aside and come back to it several times. And so it takes a while and you force the patience because you know over time at our age, the patience pays off in the end, you know. Yeah, but suggesting detail, that's a great thing too. <laughs> See if you can get away with it. Yeah, thanks for the question. Thank you for those uh, amazing paintings. Those are inspirational. And um, I was going to ask about a particular style element. Um, I notice in uh, your paintings, your use of light and how that illuminates everything is kind of inspiring. And it's uh, kind of an emotional reaction I get when I look at those paintings and they are so illuminated. Can you talk a little bit about your choice and um, your decision to make that such a style element in your paintings? Great question again, because for an artist, a sculptor or a painter, light describes everything, right? Um, it creates shape and form. But uh, thinking about the character of light, that's why going out and photographing and sketching and doing a little color sketch, capturing whatever that character is that produced the emotion, because that's, that's all I'm after is beauty. And if it could be expressed in a springtime light, which is a morning, completely different than an afternoon uh, fall light. And at, over time, spending time in Missouri and painting, you start to get to know the different characters of those lights. Um, how, I don't, it, it just becomes intuitive after a while. Um, you know, a little bit more blue, a little bit more green, you know, it's a reflection of all the foliage that's around, produces the color on the landscape. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> To follow up on that, Brian, um, do, um, you know, I've seen your studio and I've seen your works and you've shown us how your sketches work and then you lay out the whole work and man, I, I can't imagine how much time it takes and maybe you can talk to that too, but like um, curious, like, do you ever do like plein air paintings as well? Um, yeah. Or is that what you call a sketch or like, do you do, do you ever do that with yeah. oils? Yeah. Uh, used to with oils now it's just still acrylic because I'm familiar with that and can do it. Um, I judge a lot of plain air painting uh, shows, but I call myself a stale air painter because exactly <laughs> the reason you said I'm back there in that little room, uh, you know, and producing from sometimes sketches out in the field that can capture the light that we're talking about. So not very often. Um, awesome, awesome. Thank you. I'm gonna. Okay, one by one, all the artists in the crowd are getting their questions. Tell us uh, how you like working in acrylic better than oil. And when did you make that uh, yeah. transformation? Oh, let's see, I was 12 and my dad wanted to go to watercolor. So he gave me his oil set, which still had lead white. That's why I am like I am now. <laughs> It was great though. If you've ever used lead white, man, it was awesome. Um, so I just started painting like a 12 year old woods, uh, would, you know, my Norman Rockwell book open going, I can do that. And learning very quickly, no, you can't. So um, acrylic came in art school, just drilling it, drilling it, drilling it into us. Um, to a commercial artist probably should use something that's gonna dry quickly and ship. That's what it was like in the late 70s, early 80s. Boy, it changed in the late 90s. Um, but so the transition was made commercially for product at the time. Uh, most people were doing airbrush. My brother was a fantastic airbrush artist. They got the big money. I was the guy doing editorial, the kind of lower level stuff because I was still using a brush, just determined to do it old school, yeah. Um, do, do you have, uh, what's your relationship with your brother who's also um, a painter? Yeah. Who we, you know, like 
river people know of his paintings, you know? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned him. He lives in Salida, Colorado now, but he had his career, he's older than me, and he had his career starting at the Post Dispatch as an illustrator. Remember in the 1978, when they did color all of a sudden on the everyday section, that was him and Bob Shea were doing all those illustrations. And so he showed me how to be a commercial artist, really. It showed you could do it. Um, he went freelance pretty quickly and then became an uh, airbrush artist doing a lot of stuff for Anheuser-Busch. Meanwhile, I'm in California thinking I can do that. So um, yeah, uh, oh, and so he does things for national parks now, almost exclusively for the national parks. He just finished 47 giant paintings of battle scenes. And if you go to Gettysburg, you'll see them uh, on the battlefield encased in plastic permanently located there. If you go to the arch, my mural was uh, 23 feet across. That was there for the four years they were doing the renovations. His are there now. All those giant murals, those are his watercolors. Yeah, watercolors on huge boards, little bits at a time. Um, those will be there for 50 years. God darn it. <laughs> The, There's still a brother rivalry, man. Still, yeah. That's what I was trying to get at. Yeah. The, <laughs> you got it. You went right to it. Uh, how many approximately different sized brushes do you oh. possess? Oh, did you come to my studio? <laughs> okay. They're really cheap. They're plastic. God, I'm embarrassed to say. So from about this wide to really tiny for signing. <laughs> Yeah, um, and just, I ruin them. I'm just so hard on the brushes. I wish I could say they're Windsor, Newton, and there, you know. That how many different sizes? Oh, um, um, filberts and rounds exclusively. Yeah. Technical, this is technical talk. Yeah, I know. This one won't be though. <laughs> yeah, it will. Okay. Yeah, well, first, I, I think I speak for a lot of us. It was really nice of you to let a bunch of wet and some of us muddy people just come in and camp out in, in your studio. Uh, well, that was, Thanks to you. That really made the, the whole uh, experience for us much better because we were, you know, we didn't get off what we wanted to get off that week. And so that was very kind of you. Sure. Uh, I had a quick comment and then kind of a question. There's a link of Native Americans to the construction of the arch that my father told me about uh, when in 1965, he was working in the Holland building on the 11th floor in an optics lab. And you could see from that building, you could see the arch and they would go down there at lunch. Yeah. And those cranes that moved up the legs, yeah. my dad told me, I don't know how I could verify this, but that there was a small group of Native Americans in the construction crew, and one of their specific jobs is those ends of those trolleys, those cranes had to be maintained. And those are the guys that went out there with a grease gun or whatever, I don't know what they did, but they were the ones that crawled out, and Man. as it got higher and higher, they got really far off the ground. Man. So I kind of thought about that looking at the Osage Warrior uh, painting you did because it, it depicts the courage and nerves of steel thing that I remember my father talking about these guys crawling out there. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing, and this is maybe something an artist doesn't want to hear, but I look at your paintings and I get some melancholy, even a little depression sometimes because they depict kind of what we've crushed and what's not left, some things that aren't left at all and some things that are really hard to access because yeah that's gone, whether that's, right. you know, wildlife or just the landscape. Right. So I don't know um, if that goes through your mind yeah. sometimes when you're painting, but it, I, some of those paintings, I'm almost like in tears looking at them because I can see what we, we've lost. Yeah, that's a great statement and question. I, um, I that's exactly. about um, you know their memories and I thought I would like to preserve something if not their literal words but the feeling the look of them or what they did I mean shingle makers they took apart a green oak you know how hard that is in little bits 
oh my God, you know, and I, I haven't even touched the surface. You guys in this room, think about the stories we could tell that you have knowledge that I would love to know about. And, you know, it's hard to take some of these stories and put them into visual form. Um, so I, I, it's, I feel really lucky when it happens and it translates to the feeling that you express. So I'm, I'm glad, I'm sorry, but I'm glad it did. <laughs> That's kind of what I'm trying to do. Yeah. All right, I, I've got one more question and maybe we're done then, I don't know. Um, so I get, I'm on your email list. And for those of you that aren't like, get on his email list, it's the coolest thing ever. Like this painting showed up in my inbox the other day and it was just like, what? They love bluebells. Um, and so one time this painting came and it was of the area called Portage to Sioux. And, and you describe a story in the email about this painting that had been commissioned. Um, and then the painting has a similar to some of the, the uh, works that you showed today. There was just kind of a, a group of, I believe it was Osage um, running through the woods and then there's some canoes on the river going downstream. And uh, based on like the story you were telling, oh, and then there's these pelicans flying like through the middle and sort of based on the story you were telling, I was like, well, that's Pelican Island. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I was just like, that's so cool that you put yeah. pelicans and it's Pelican Island. And you're like, I had no idea it was Pelican Island. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and they're going the wrong way. <laughs> What'd you say? They're going the wrong way. <laughs> right. And then, I, you know, it just cascaded from there, right? Yeah. It's like, all right, I'm never emailing you again. But um, I but I, I just kind of wondered, like, you do these commissions for people <laughs> and, like, you know, you're basing it on stories, you're basing it on things you've seen, you're basing it on going out to places and sketching things. Um, but then, you know, your creativity takes over and the story takes over. I'm just kind of curious if there's other little things like that, little fortuitous things that happen where it's like you show someone a painting and they're like, oh my God, you, I didn't tell you to do that, but you did this thing. Right. Like, yeah. And that's the magic that happens. It doesn't always happen. And, and then sometimes you, you intend it and it nope, falls flat. Nope. <laughs> nope. Didn't happen. Or you guys read a lot. I'm sure we all read diverse things. And so there's a cross fertilization between what you're painting, what you're researching and this book that's completely unrelated, but oh my God, there's a relation between the two. And then you finish a painting. I just put in some pelicans because I thought they were cool. And then I, my friend Steve says, that's Pelican Island, right? And I go, yeah. <laughs> of course. That's beautiful. Um, does anyone, <laughs> anyone have any other questions or? Just want to talk about yourself or anything? <laughs> awesome. Well, Brian, um, for those of us that are fans of, of your work, and, and for a lot of us, it weaves into our lives and the landscape, you know, that we like live our lives in. And it, it's probably way more important than you realize. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and share that with us. Thanks um, for having me. Yeah.